I want to start off by asking you a strange question. What does it mean to you to be supernatural? To me, being supernatural is to be able to change your body by thought alone. To say it another way, it means being greater than your body. Being supernatural also means overcoming challenges and conditions in your outer environment that most people would not be able to accomplish. In addition, being supernatural would also mean to be able to change some predictable future destiny or event, that is, to be greater than time. Now, is this something that's only reserved for ancient yogis, mystical masters, and superheroes? Is it fantasy, or is there medical proof that each human being has the potential to heal themselves, and in a sense, to become supernatural? In 1986, I had my own personal experience that forever changed my life. A serious injury forced me to meld together everything I knew from my scientific mind and my training to a greater level of understanding about the nature of reality and what is possible. Much of what I discovered was not found in conventional textbooks and mainstream science. In fact, I had to find answers for my own personal healing by delving into areas of science that point the finger at possibility. So let's start with some basics about the brain that you should know right from the very start. I want to offer you a new way of concepting your brain. Think of your brain as three brains in one. You literally have three brains that allow you to go from thinking to doing to being. So let's start off with your first brain, called your neocortex. Your neocortex is the seat of your conscious mind. It's the largest and most evolved in human beings and dolphins. This is the part of your brain that plugs you into three-dimensional reality. It's divided into different regions and different areas. So the front of the brain, called the forebrain, makes up 40% of your entire brain. It's the largest in human beings, and it's what separates us from all other species. The next closest species, gibbons and chimpanzees, their frontal lobe is about 14 to 17 percent, dogs about 7 percent, and cats about 3 percent. Now the frontal lobe has been known to be called the area of executive function. But think of the frontal lobe as the CEO of the brain or the symphony leader. The frontal lobe allows us to decide on action to focus our concentration, to invent, to speculate, to have intention or attention. It's the area of our brain that restrains our emotional reactions or begins to speculate new possibilities. Now, the rest of the brain is divided up into geography as well. For example, the back of your brain, called the occipital lobe or the visual cortex, is where you process sight or spatial orientation. There's strips in areas of your brain that allow you to feel certain things with your body or to invoke or begin to initiate motor function or movement. There are areas of the brain that allow you to make long-term memories and to begin to distinguish between self and non-self. But the entire brain is mapped geographically and think of that first brain as that part of the brain that allows you to learn new things and to have new experiences. So then, every time you learn something new, you make new connections in your brain. Learning is forging new synaptic connections. In some of the latest research in neuroscience that says that one hour of focused concentration on one concept or idea literally doubles the number of connections in your brain, literally produces physical evidence as a result of your interaction in the environment. Now, the next step is to take that knowledge, that philosophy, and to begin to apply it, to personalize it, to demonstrate it, to initiate that knowledge in some way. And if you do this properly, and you can get your behaviors to match your intentions, you can get your actions equal to your thoughts, you can get your mind and body working together, you're going to have a new experience. Now, when you're in the midst of an experience, all of your five senses plug you into the environment. 
And as all of that sensory information rushes back to your brain, jungles of neurons begin to organize themselves into patterns and networks. So then experience then enriches the philosophical circuits in your brain. And when those neurons begin to form into networks, the second brain called the limbic brain, the emotional brain, the chemical brain, the mammalian brain, begins to make a chemical. And that chemical is called a feeling or an emotion. So the moment you feel unlimited, the moment you feel abundant, the moment you feel free from any experience, now you are teaching your body chemically to understand what your mind is intellectually understood. So we could say that knowledge is for the mind and experience is for the body. And in that moment, you are embodying the truth of that philosophy. And because there's new information coming in from the environment, you're literally beginning to change your genetic destiny by signaling new genes in new ways. And it is the limbic brain or the chemical brain that begins to manufacture those chemicals so that your body begins to become chemically instructed to understand what your mind is intellectually understood. Now the limbic brain also has some other functions. It is the seat of your autonomic nervous system. And think of your autonomic nervous system as your automatic nervous system. This is the part of the brain that subconsciously regulates blood sugar levels, hormone levels, temperature, respiration, heart rate. This is the part of the brain that's giving us life automatically. And so then when you begin to manufacture that chemical from an experience, the emotional signature from that experience begins to change your body in some way. If you've been able to create that experience once, you should be able to recreate it again. And if you're able to recreate any experience over and over again, you are going to begin to neurochemically condition your mind and body begin to work as one. And if you've done something so many times that your body now knows how to do it as well as your mind, now it's innate in you. It's second nature. It's easy. It's automatic. It's familiar. In fact, you've done it so many times that you no longer have to consciously think about it. So then you know you do it, but you don't know how you know how. And we could say now that you're developing a skill or a habit. In other words, you're beginning to master that philosophy and you're moving into a new state of being. And when you do this properly over and over again, you activate that third brain called your cerebellum. This is the part of the brain that's responsible for you beginning to develop what's called implicit memories or non-declarative memories, where you've done something so many times that you no longer have to consciously think about it. It's who you are. So our job then is to go from knowledge to experience to wisdom, from mind to body to soul from learning it with your head, applying it with your hands, and knowing it by heart. And I can tell you that common people around the world are doing the uncommon when they follow this formula. They're healing themselves of near fatal diseases. They're reversing cancers. They're healing from childhood scars and wounds. They're creating new jobs, new opportunities, and they're having mystical experiences that transcend language and they look just like you. Let's talk about different ways on how the brain works. Number one, we've all heard that when you lose a certain number of neurons in your brain, that those neurons will never come back. But there's an emerging field of science called neurogenesis. And neurogenesis literally means the growth of new neurons. And our research has found that when people begin to learn new things, and have new experiences, not only will they begin to cultivate new synaptic connections in their brain, but they will actually flourish the growth of new neurons as a result of those novel experiences and learning. And we've even discovered that within four days, 
we begin to activate the very gene that processes that change. So, the studies that were done in the early 1900s said that no neurons could grow in the brain. Those scientists were studying rodents in an unchanging environment. So if rodents are in an unchanging environment and there's no new stimulation, there's no new activities, there's no new experiences, then their brains will stay the same. Now let's talk about you. If you think the same thoughts every single day, and for the most part, most people, 80% to 90% of their thoughts are the same thoughts as the day before. And your biology, your neurocircuitry, your neurochemistry, your hormones, and even your gene expression is equal to how you think, how you act, and how you feel. And in other words, everything stays the same in the body if you stay the same. Well, it begs the question then, is it possible that new thoughts that lead to new choices, that lead to new behaviors, that create new experiences, that lead to new emotions and new feelings, that could inspire new thoughts, begin to change your biology, would you begin to see significant changes in the brain as well as the body? And our research proves that when you change, everything changes around you. The second concept I want to talk about is the concept of coherence. And think about coherence as rhythm or order or synchronization. People who live by the hormones of stress on a daily basis, and for the most part, that's 70% of the time for most human beings. And when you're living in stress, you're living in survival. And when you're perceiving some threat in your external environment, where you perceive a danger, you have the perception of something that could get worse, it turns on that primitive nervous system called your fight or flight nervous system. And when you're in stress, you're always trying to control or predict an outcome. So people who live under the gun of those chemicals, those emergency chemicals, are shifting their attention very quickly from one person in their life to another person in their life, to something at some place at some time, to meetings, to places they have to go. And every single one of those elements that are known in their external environment are neurological networks that are reflected in their brain. So under the urgency and the arousal of the stress hormones, we begin to shift our attention from one person to one thing. We activate these individual circuits. And like a lightning storm in the clouds, the brain begins to fire out of order, very incoherently. And when the brain is incoherent, you're incoherent. And when the brain isn't working right, you're not working right. So if you have the ability to practice being present and truly not thinking about what could happen in your future or what's happened in your past, but truly practice every single day and in. If you keep doing that, if there is no predictable future and there is no familiar past and you're in the present moment, there should be possibilities that you haven't considered before. The beauty behind all of that means that the moment you are open to possibility and you're no longer focusing on knowns or familiars in your life, that's the moment you start experiencing those synchronicities, those serendipities, those coincidences that are happening all around you because you're no longer investing your energy in a predictable future or a familiar past. And I think that you can teach that. And I think when people really start centering themselves and practicing that, they should expect the unexpected in their life. They should expect unknown events to begin to occur, possibilities that they haven't thought of. Because if they thought of them, they would have done them and there would have been a known. But so we have to stretch out into that world of possibilities, which is the unknown. And I'm interested in that supernatural process. I believe in human potential, and I've witnessed transformation and healings enough times to say that anybody can do it if they're given the proper instruction. I'm going to assume that 
The expression of this divine intelligence within us is the expression of life, which is equal to the health of the body. And that I think when we take time out of our busy lives to invest in ourselves, to become a work in progress, to begin to decide what thoughts we no longer want to think, what behaviors we'd like to change, what emotions we want to transform. And every single day, make an effort to remove the blocks and the masks, the facades that stop the flow of the divine in us. When we begin to do that kind of work, that intelligence begins to move through us. And that's when we become more like it. We become more willful. It has an amazing will. And we become more mindful. It has an infinite mind. Uh, we become more conscious. It's a consciousness. We become more loving. It's a loving, uh, it's a loving intelligence. We become more giving. It's a giver of life. I think its nature begins to become our nature. Uh, its mind begins to become our mind. And the side effect of that, I think, was we move from this selfish state to this selfless state. And transformation does something really amazing. When you free yourself, from the chains of those emotions that keep you anchored in the past and you go from particle to wave from matter to energy and you begin to liberate energy and your heart starts to open and you feel one or connected to something greater there's only one thing you want to do when you feel this way and that is you want to give you say I feel so amazing uh, I want you to feel the way I feel and so the natural tendency is to give something away because you feel so whole in that moment that it's impossible to want. Now, why would you want when you're whole? Now, that to me is the natural state of being. Disease can exist in that state of holism. And I think that it's reachable in our lives. And I think that people can reach those elegant states and it can begin to become more constant. So, how do we become supernatural then is the question. And that is, we have to start doing what feels unnatural. In the beginning, of course, change is going to be uncomfortable. It's going to feel unfamiliar. There's going to be some uncertainty. Uh, you can't predict when you step into the unknown what that's like. And most people rush back to their familiar feelings and familiar behaviors. And they say, this feels right. No, it feels familiar. Becoming comfortable in that unknown where the best way to predict your future is to create it. And be able to create from that place of the unknown begins to produce supernatural effects in our lives. So then giving when everybody else is in lack is supernatural. Demonstrating compassion when everybody's angry and judgmental is supernatural. Showing signs of love and strength and courage when everybody else is in fear. I think if we keep doing what feels unnatural, uh, sooner or later we'll begin to become supernatural. And this is a time in history right now where people are looking for answers and they secretly believe in, their, in themselves. And I think that belief in ourselves and belief in the infinite possibilities makes life really exciting. So when our will matches that intelligence within us as well. When, when, our, when our mind matches its mind and when our